morning. I'd like to begin by um, offering my thanks to the organizers for having put this conference together, in particular the significant personal efforts of Gail Sissier. Um, I had the, the challenge of going through a, a vast topic in 10 minutes. So um, I, I, I will apologize in advance uh, for being somewhat cursory. Uh, to begin with, with regard to harnessing dislocations for portfolio construction, we need to first define what we mean by dislocations. And over the last 10 to 12 years, we've been looking at dislocations from a three-dimensional perspective. Firstly, with regard to volatility of correlations. So looking across a multi-asset spectrum for relationships that are really quite stretched. Um, secondly, correlation of volatility. So the relationships between the risks of market A and market B. And thirdly, uh, changes in uncertainty over time or volatility of volatility. With regard to how one then brings all these three forms of dislocations together for portfolio construction, I think the key aspect here is really about consistency and being able to do so on a regular basis so that one can then do two things. Um, I identify those dislocations for alpha generation, but more importantly, also for identifying uh, uh, risk concentrations and to distinguish effective versus perceived diversification. So, turning to current dislocations, if we look at um, uh, stretched uh, um, uh, relationships from a volatility of correlation point of view, in the fixed income space, one of the things we see, unsurprisingly, given the monetary policy stance uh, from the ECB, is a dislocation between the boom and the tenure note in the US. And if we look at the current correlations and where they are on a, on, a, on, a, on a distribution, what we do is actually put plot every single correlation on a distribution and put it on a percentile basis. So over approximately three decades, the current correlation of around 0 0.17 is on the 10th percentile. So this relationship is pretty much uh, stretched on a, on, a, on, a, on a three decade basis. Now why is that relevant? Well, if we're building a, a global multi-asset portfolio or indeed just a fixed income portfolio, the diversification benefits one could possibly glean by having both of these assets is different now than it has been before and this can be weaved into the wider investment strategy of a firm. Turning to equities, um, I thought I'd look at an Asian example. And um, what I find interesting is uh, the extent to which, despite all the negative news flow we've seen out of Korea, the um, uh, price changes in the Hang Seng have resulted in this relationship dropping, again, of a, a generation to the 21st percentile. So really very much in the sort of lower quarter of where this relationship has been. So the marginal diversification benefits of including both of these assets within the uh, within uh, an EM um, component um, or a wider Asian component may be quite interesting. Um, forgive me for being brief on each of these. Turning to commodities, um, I thought we couldn't really have a conference without putting up a chart of oil and gold given all the conversations we've been having right now in the industry. And what's interesting is that going back over 30 years, 32 years in this case, of looking at daily correlations, these are calculated using um, uh, quarterly correlations on a day-by-day -day basis. We find that the latest value of minus 0 0.24 here, going back over 30 years, is right on the edge of the distribution. This correlation is on the first percentile. So this relationship between these two core commodities are pretty much as dislocated as we've seen for over a generation. So the context within which we're allocated in a multi-asset portfolio, the portfolio construction context is as stressed as it has arguably ever been. Uh, turning to the second dimension of um, um, uh, correlation of volatility, so the relationship between the risks, um, here I'm using two forward-looking measures. So the VIX for <coughs> US equity volatility and the Merrill Lynch uh, Move Index, which is a forward-looking bond volatility measure. And if we look at the relationship between these two on a shorter time period of the last three years, again, we are at, at, at relatively stretched levels um, in the top quintile. But on, in this case, we're actually finding that the relationship between the risks is far closer 
than it has been historically. So from the point of view of allocating a risk budget um, as part of portfolio construction, this needs to be taken into account. And finally, with regard to volatility off volatility, so effectively changes in uncertainty over time. We spend quite a lot of time modeling volatility for different asset classes. Um, and in this case, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the Euro stocks 50, given what we've been seeing over the last week, particularly with regard to all the um, excitement and uh, discussion of what the ECB's been doing. The ramifications of all this uncertainty for Euros and equities actually just places us around the median of what we have seen historically, which is quite interesting given some of the significant monetary <laughs> policy dislocations we're seeing. And with regard to volatility cones, um, we try and work um, in an interdisciplinary way. For those who are familiar with options trading, they'll be familiar with volatility cones. But essentially what we're doing is looking at the term structure of volatility over time, from short-term vol to longer-term vol, and we get a natural coning effect across different markets, as we do in this particular one. The black lines are the minimum and the maximum ever observed, the turquoise line is the median, the dark blue bars are the interquartile ranges. Red is where we are now. And what we're finding is that on a 12-month basis, we're actually approaching the 75th percentile in terms of where we are with regard to the volatility of this particular market, the Eurostoxx 50, um, in the wider context of time. This is relevant from the point of view of portfolio construction because, again, when deploying a risk budget, it's incredibly helpful to know the context within which we're allocating that risk budget in the context of time. Turning, secondly, to, so, having identified um, a few examples of dislocations <coughs> across fixed income, equities, commodities, and volatility. The question then becomes, how do we then apply that in a portfolio construction context? Well, I think the key aspect here is consistency. And tools such as what we call influence matrices, where you can look at a variety of target variables, in this case, relative global sector returns, and along the top, various different macro factors that one may find interesting, what we call influence variables. You can then start tracking and monitoring which of them are currently dislocated. And each cell here represents the latest correlation, and in brackets, the percentile. So if you've got a particular number, um, the top and bottom quintiles are highlighted in red and green. So if you've got, for example, global autos and gold coming out at a, at a really high level, on a percentile basis, you can look at it on an absolute basis and say, well, does it actually mean anything for my portfolio construction? This allows us to distinguish the noise from the information in a very summary way. And I think given the kind of dislocations and the number of dislocations we're seeing right now, it's important to have consistency in the way these dislocations are identified, tracked, and then ultimately incorporated. And this is the final bit. I think as portfolio constructors in this generation, we are different to previous generations in the sense that we have access to tools that previously were not available. Um, our predecessors you know, may have had fantastic intuition with regard to uh, the quality of diversification in a portfolio. But today we can deploy big data analytics to look at all the cross relationships within a portfolio. So this is an um, a typical institutional European equity portfolio with around 40 to 50 assets and we're looking at well over a thousand cross relationships and being able to look at that on a real-time basis um, is greatly assisted by using systems enabling the individual to then focus on in this case the nine key relationships that are currently dislocated on a security by security basis and I think this allows us to actually get a better handle on the multi-dimensional dislocations we're seeing now across fixed income, equities, currencies, commodities, and how they may manifest within the specific um, investment universe that we may participate in. That's all I want to cover. We've got maybe one or two minutes of questions if anyone has any thoughts or observations. No? Well, thank you very much for your attention. And the full back. Thanks.